The Big 12 finally got a negotiation deal done with Texas and OU to exit the conference early. We'll talk about that and more next on Lockdown Horn Frogs. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. It is Locked On Horn Frogs. You can subscribe on YouTube. I've been saying this for a little while, but we are dangerously close to 500 subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed on YouTube, we'd love to have you do that. You can also get the podcast wherever you uh, get your favorite podcast, different various platforms, and the audio version. And then also I'm on Twitter at Simcox Steven. The show is at Locked On TCU. Um, so on Thursday evening, the news came down that Texas and Oklahoma would be exiting the Big 12 after this upcoming academic season. And so one more football game. Um, on the road in Norman, one more game at home against UT for the TCU Horn Frogs this season, and then those two schools will leave for the SEC. Yes, of course, there is money involved in this. The two schools will forfeit a combined $100 million in revenue that will be distributed amongst the um, eight member schools and not some of the new additions. So that is beneficial for TCU and the schools that are kind of left over. Uh, so we'll only have one year of this 14-team conference with Cincinnati and Houston, UCF and BYU, along with Oklahoma and Texas before they then depart for the SEC. And so we're going to see this huge sea change in college football in a couple of years where Oklahoma and Texas will be in the SEC, USC and UCLA will be in the Big Ten, and then the Big uh, 12 team playoff will start as well. And so we'll have a new format in college football. Ultimately, I think this is good for everybody. Obviously, Texas and OU wanted to leave. Um, the Big 12 wanted them to leave as well. So it makes sense that the deal would, you know, come together. One of our YouTube commenters, I think it was Jack Daddy Slim, he he commented um, last week and corrected me. It was like, hey, this is not really the Big 12 holding Texas and OU hostage with the revenue situation or the money situation, the exit fee. It's, it's more linked with Fox and them not willing to give up their inventory. And, yes, there's a lot of truth to that. Fox – was sort of the the odd broadcast partner out here because the ESPN will be taking on um, the SEC exclusively in 2024, and so uh, Fox was going to basically lose some of their uh, you know games. They're going to lose these Texas No U games that they had under contract over the next season, um, and so they worked some things out to get that done. And then obviously the Big 12 will get some cash as well. What does it mean for the league moving forward? I've said this before. I don't really – I know this is this might be naive of me. I don't really care so much about the money. Like, I understand why it's important. I understand why these these TV deals are, are huge matters in the college ball landscape. I get that the Big Ten and the SEC, with the amount of money their schools are going to be getting in the future, are sort of breaking away from the rest of college football or separating themselves from the rest of college football with those types of resources. Um, but I really only worry about money if it's going to my pocket. So I'm not, I'm not super invested in like, okay, these exit fees and how it works out. I get why the big 12 and the member schools are, and they ultimately got their wish. They're getting the payday from Texas and Oklahoma. But I think from a big 12 perspective, Brett, your Mark sort of gambled by taking a TV deal. Like he didn't, he didn't sit around and wait to you know, let this go to market and see what was going to happen. He went and said, "All right, let's get a TV deal done." And he did that because he wanted stability. So he, you know, he hit this thirty-one million dollar mark for all the schools because he wanted everybody to know where they stood. He wanted the league to kind of rally behind one another and say, "This is where we want to be." And I think to this point, that is proven to be pretty shrewd because the Pac-12 at the moment has a lot of uncertainty. They still don't have a media rights deal done. There was a report in The Athletic last week that was basically saying the Pac-12 is not getting the money that they thought they would from TV partners. Um, ESPN has basically pulled away from the moment and said, hey, you, you have our best offer. You know, if you want to talk, we can talk, but that's we're not going above that. Um, Amazon Prime is interested, but – they are sort of waiting to see what happens with Pac-12 football. It's also fascinating the, the Amazon Prime or any of these streaming services 
is a weird dynamic because Josh Neighbors pointed this out in Locked on Big 12. A lot of these streaming platforms have done just sort of one-off deals. Like Amazon Prime is doing Thursday Night Football. And it's a big deal because it's NFL games, but it's once a week. It's one broadcast a week. Everybody knows you can only get that on Prime. And they're not taking on just a massive TV package because that's a big undertaking from a production standpoint. It's just this one game, and people know they know where it's at. Um, and one thing about linear television is that you still get a number of folks that will just be flipping through the channels and say, oh, hey, you know, all right, this game's on. Let me stop down and watch this for a little bit. Um, with streaming, it's trickier because people are going to a platform. Um, and in a lot of cases, they know what they're watching, even though de people definitely do surf on, on these different platforms. Um, but they're, they're not necessarily in the mindset of like, I'm going to sit down and watch a game. Oh, man, you know, Arizona State, Arizona's on. Let me let me click on that. Um, and, and so I, I don't know what the numbers will be there, but it would kind of be – if they did like an exclusively streaming deal, it would be sort of the first of its kind. Uh, and essentially, George Glykoff promised these Pac-12 schools like $40 million a year, and he's not getting that at the market. And because of what the Big 12 settled for, um, a lot of partners are saying, well, hey, why, why should we give you significantly more than the Big 12? What do you bring to the table? And so Pac-12 is now exploring different options. They went and visited with SMU. They're talking with San Diego State. They're going to talk to Boise State, other schools around the West Coast, and try to expand their footprint and basically say, hey, if we have more inventory, does that mean we'll get more money? And you could also use the idea of if you bring on new members, give them less of the pie to, to start with so that your existing members get more money and you can spend it that way. Um, so I think there is a, I think there's an opportunity here for the Big 12 to get in the year of some of these Pac-12 schools. The question is, who wants to ultimately move? Because Andy Staples said this too. It's like, from a Pac-12 perspective, if you have access to the playoffs still, and if, the, if there's not a huge difference in the money, what's the reason to leave? Now, I think the Big 12 can sell stability. I think they can sell that they're a conference that desperately cares about athletics and football and basketball in a way that some Pac-12 schools might not. But, you know, it's still going to be a little bit of a, of a sell job, and that's part of what Brett Yormark has been brought on to do. So it'll be really interesting to see how this plays out over the next few weeks and months. But I think this is good for everybody. If you want to drop your reaction to the news that Texas and Oklahoma will be moving on after um, this next you know, sports season, let me know here in the YouTube comments. You can also hit me up on Twitter at Simcox Stephen. When we come back, TCU basketball dropped another heartbreaking game to Baylor over the weekend. We keep hearing about how good this team is at full strength. What does that look like, though, if they keep dropping these games? We'll talk about that next. Before we do that, though, um, LinkedIn jobs, I talk about them frequently. If you have a job posting, you need to go to LinkedIn. It's, it's just the best place to find the best people. They have simple screening questions that will allow you to narrow down your field um, and get the right person for your business, talent acquisition, finding the right people that fit your culture, that fit what you're doing. It's the most important part of running a business. Uh, LinkedIn.com slash college. You can post your jobs for free there. Again, it's linkedin.com slash locked on college. Don't make this complicated. Everybody knows LinkedIn. Everybody goes there. It's the best place to cast a wide net and find the people that fit what you want to do. Again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college. All right, we continue to roll along here on locked on horn frogs, uh, TCU basketball. They took on Baylor at home on Saturday and you know, it was it was a close game. Uh, they ended up falling seventy two to sixty eight. It was a game where the frogs led at halftime, thirty four to thirty one. Um, had a nine point lead at one point in the second half. Seemed to be rolling offensively. We're kind of getting what they want on that side of the on that side of the court. But then slowly, Baylor started to make a comeback, and it was really um, Adam Flagler who had a huge game for the Bears uh, and sort of went off. Adam Flagler and LJ Cryer, both with, with big-time uh, buckets down the stretch, and TCU ends up falling in that game 72-68. From a TCU perspective, um, Damian Ball led the way with 16 points, and 
he was really good later in the game. Uh, Frogs went down by six with about a minute left. It seemed like the game was over. And Ball was able to get to the rim and get some buckets. It looked like Chuck O'Bannon had a clean steal. Uh, that was in, it ended up being called a foul. And then TC was actually able to force a turnover with eight seconds left and get the ball back with a chance to tie the game or take the lead down two. And Damian came up and took an 18-footer. Didn't like that shot selection. You know, it's like either get to the rim or take a three. They did not shoot the three well on Saturday at all. Uh, and they haven't shot the ball well from deep in a while. Chuck O'Bannon is really struggling right now um, shooting-wise. You know, uh, it's not really falling for, for Rondell Walker. Micah Peavy hit a few threes. But overall, this is just a team that's not shooting the basketball well. Andy Swain was on Twitter, and he's a frequent listener, interactor, and he said, you know, Emmanuel Miller and Jacoby Coles both missed free throws down the stretch that were killers. Miller had an and one um, where he could have tied the game at 62. He clanged the free throw, uh, and then Baylor got the ball back, and then Jacoby Coles had a rebound and got fouled had front end of a one and one If he makes both shots, then it's a tie game again. And he missed, you know, the front end of that one and one and Baylor took the ball and started to add to that lead. And I said on Twitter, I was like, man, those, those free throws were killers. This was a winnable game. And, and Andy Swain said, well, they were two of 10 from three. And that was a bigger part of it. And I agree with you, Andy. I think my thing is <laughs> this team's not a great three point shooting team. They're just not. And I don't know how to solve that. If Chuck O'Bannon's not hitting shots, and there's really not many other guys. You know, Shahade Wells has shown to be a streaky scorer at times. Uh, there's just not a lot of guys that can knock it down. They don't have a, a you know a knockdown setup shooter. Obviously, when Miles gets back, he'll help in that capacity as well. Um, but I just I don't expect them to shoot well from three. I don't necessarily expect them to shoot well from the free throw line either. But Emmanuel Miller and Jacoby Goals might be their two best free throw shooters. And I just I was that was like a killer moment in the game to me or the momentum kind of shifted. But overall, uh, you know, struggled to get stops down the stretch, struggled to find a way to score. It's just hard in the half court when Miles was not there. Eddie Lampkin was also not there, reportedly because of a family situation. Condolences to Eddie. Um, he was he was at a funeral on Saturday, and so he should be back with the team for the game against Iowa State on Wednesday. Still not sure what Mike Miles' status is. Flagler had 28 for Baylor. He ended up being Big 12 Player of the Week. Uh, LJ Cryer with 23. Now, I do want to highlight something, and it would be much more uh, exciting to talk about if they had won, but Micah Peavy guarded Keontae George uh, for most of the game on Saturday. Keontae George for Baylor, the guard. I mean, he might be a top-10 pick uh, this upcoming for the upcoming NBA draft. Like He's a, he's a one-and-done type guy, absolute stud. He did a great job against him. I mean, frustrated him. George only had four points. He ended up sitting on the bench for, for a lot of the second half. Um, and Micah had a good day scoring the ball too. Like he's been, he's been a real bright spot, even in, you know, some of these hard losses lately. I think Damian Ball played really hard and did some nice things. Just that it was a, a tough shot at the end there. You know, Manuel Miller is still doing his thing. Um, Xavier Cork had some nice moments. They desperately need Mike Miles back. And everyone is saying, and I think there's some truth to this, but everyone continues to say, man, when this team is at full strength, Watch out, right? Like when, when they have Mike and Eddie back, they, they could be one of the best teams in the country. They can beat anybody the way they can get up and down the floor, the way they can score with Mike on the court, you know, you know the way Eddie adds a presence inside for them. And I think that's true. I just get concerned. You've lost three in a row now in Big 12 play. You're going on the road to Ames, and whether or not Mike is back, that's going to be a tough game because that's a tough place to play. They just dropped their first game of the season at Hilton Coliseum this past weekend, and the Cyclones have lost two in a row. So they're going to be fired up and ready to go. Um, and, and there's been – it's just – there's been two games now, and it's Oklahoma State and Baylor, where you had a chance to close it out late um, and get victories without two of your best players, and unfortunately, they just couldn't do it. They're now 6-6 six and six in Big 12 play. Um, you know, they're not in danger. They're 22nd in the AP poll. They're not in any danger of falling out of the tournament right now. But those losses keep piling up. And it gets more concerning. It, what it does is it gives you less margin of error once you're at full strength. Um, you you got to find a way to, to reel off some victories here to close the season. And I think they can do that. I'm not pressing the panic button. I just, I'm hearing a lot about like peak TCU can run with anybody. I get it. I'm just trying to think of how often we've seen peak TCU this year. Like, even when they're fully healthy, I think of the game at Allen Fieldhouse against Kansas. 
I think the, the game against Oklahoma at home where they really looked like a, a juggernaut. And that was sort of, you know, that was around the time when Mike got hurt. So maybe it, maybe it is as simple as they just have to get healthy again and get that momentum back. But there were also games this year, even at full strength, like blowing that lead to Texas. And Texas is a great basketball team. They very well could go and win the Big 12. They, I think, would be the favorites right now. You know, tough loss to Iowa State at home. You just have to find a way to get right before March and not fall completely out of the seeding picture. Um, and that's going to be the challenge for this team moving forward. We'll wrap up Locked on Horn Frogs here in a moment. I do want to mention, though, Built Bar. Built Bar, it's, it's the best protein bar around. And I, I've talked about them for a long time. We're in February now. If your New Year's resolution was to lose weight and you're sitting here in the middle of February and you're like, man, I'm not doing well, well start a good habit by taking up Built Bar because – it's delicious. It's also good for you. Limited calories, limited sugar, carbohydrates. It's not something that's going to kill your diet, kill your lifestyle if you have it. Actually, it's probably going to help promote a healthy lifestyle. Um, you know, I like to eat them for breakfast. They have a bunch of different flavors. The churro flavor is my favorite right now. Builtbar.com. Order today. Use that promo code locked on. Get a little bit of a discount on your first order or your next order. You can also find them at the local Sam's Club if you uh, have a membership there and want to look around. Look for Built Bar. Again, you know, the new year keeps churning along. Start making these good decisions. Let Built Bar do it for you. And it's real chocolate. It's real ingredients. It's not just, you know, standard stuff that, that tastes fake and that makes you actually want a real cookie. It's it's good for you, and, it's, uh, and it tastes good as well. BuiltBar.com. Give it a try today. All right. Tomorrow, um, we'll continue to have some TCU basketball talk as they – uh, get ready for that game against Iowa State. TCU baseball, they will open their season this week at Globe Life um, against Vanderbilt on Friday. Should be a great weekend to see TCU baseball in action. Excited about this team. I think there's a lot of questions, but there's also a lot of excitement. Pick to finish first and, and win the Big 12 in the preseason. I think that speaks to the respect everybody has uh, for Kirk Sarloose and this group. They play number 10 Vanderbilt. On Friday at 3 p.m., number eight, Arkansas at 7 p.m. on Saturday, and then close out with a Sunday night game against Mizzou at 6.30 uh, before a midweek game with UT Arlington. And then next weekend, they take on Florida State in Fort Worth. So uh, not like dipping your toe in the water. They're playing some really good teams early and often this season. Um, TCU baseball getting ready to rock and roll. This is the Lockdown Horn Frogs. I'm Stephen Simcox, your host. Subscribe on YouTube if you would like. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be back tomorrow. It's your team every day.